This is the McLaren P1, and it is the ultimate modern McLaren. The McLaren Senna is amazing, of course, but this is the king of the hill. With prices approaching $2 million, this is the most impressive McLaren road car, aside from the famous F1. And today, I'm going to review it. I've borrowed this P1 from Manny Koshbin, an entrepreneur here in Newport Beach in Orange County in Southern California. He has an amazing fleet of exotic cars. He also has a YouTube channel. The channel name is on the screen and you can subscribe by clicking the link in the description below. And you should subscribe because Manny is always doing cool stuff with his truly incredible collection of cars. It's amazing. Manny also recently launched a mentorship program called Manny Koshbin's Millionaire Mentorship. And I will also also link that in the description below and you can check it out. But back to the P1. Now the P1 went on sale back in 2013 and it was one of the holy trinity of supercars meant to rival the LaFerrari and the Porsche 918 Spyder. The P1 is the rarest of the three with just 375 units made and it puts up some truly unbelievable numbers. It has a twin turbocharged V8 that makes 727 horsepower and 530 pound-feet of torque. Now that's mated to an electric motor for more power and torque, and the total output is 903 horsepower and 723 pound-feet. Those are crazy figures, but so is this car's performance. It'll do 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds. It'll top out at 217 miles an hour, and it runs the quarter mile in the low 10 second range at around 150 miles an hour. It's insane. But you can also use your P1 to save the planet. There's an eco mode, you turn it on and you can drive on purely electric power with no gasoline engine at all. It only works for a few miles, but you can do it in case you wanna be extra eco-friendly. And yes, these things are selling for insane money. Current asking prices on AutoTrader range from $1.4 to $2.2 million, with this one being particularly special because it is the only P1 finished in bare matte carbon fiber. So anyway, today I'm going to take you on a tour of the P1 and I'm going to show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features of the P1 with getting in, and that means we must start with the key. Now, when you buy a car like this, they don't just give you a key like you get when you buy your car. Instead, you get this nice silver box with carbon fiber on the front, and it says P1. You open it up, and you have two keys beautifully displayed like jewelry inside this soft casing with orange velvet on the inside of the lid. You also have a little USB stick that I guess includes photos of the car or track times or I'm not entirely sure, but either way, this is how the keys are presented in a P1. You take the key out and then you can climb inside. But before you climb into your P1, you run into a little bit of an issue because there's no immediately obvious door handle on the outside of this door. There's nowhere that you can grab to open it. Well, it turns out that you walk up to the P1, you look inside this hole, which is actually an air intake, and there are two buttons hidden in there. The button on the right, you push that and it locks the car. So that's what you press if you wanna walk away and lock your P1. The button on the left, you push that and it will unlock the car and it will also pop open the door just slightly. So if you press it, the door will go to this position. But then it's kind of up to you to reach under here where your hand can grab and open up the door, which is surprisingly heavy and then it opens up upwards like a supercar door should. Now, once you have the door in this position, there are a couple of interesting items worth discussing. The most notable is this little white stripe that goes around the entire interior of the door. And you can see this stripe says on it MSO, which stands for McLaren Special Operations. They will kind of tailor make your P1 to your exact taste. I've seen a lot of tailor made options and features, but I've never seen the inside of the door painted 
with a white stripe. However, I have to admit it is a pretty cool touch and it's kind of nice to have on a car where the door opens up and attracts a lot of attention. Why white, you're probably thinking? Well, this car used to be white. Obviously it isn't any longer, we'll cover that in a few minutes. And another interesting item that reveals itself with the door up, you can see there are two buttons mounted at the base of the door that kind of face out when the door is in this position. One of those buttons is to put the car into tow mode so that it can be safely towed, and the other button pops the trunk. And since I'm talking about the trunk button, might as well get inside and see what the trunk is all about. Now, when you press that trunk button, it puts the trunk in this position. You can see it's kind of popped up from the rest of the bodywork. And you go to open it and you will notice there is no latch in the front, like basically every other car with a front trunk. So how do you open the trunk? Well, it turns out you stick your hand into like this nostril in front and there's a little button hidden in there. You push it pretty hard and it releases the trunk and then you pop it open. And that's how you open the trunk in a McLaren P1. And now that we're in the cargo compartment, a couple of interesting items worth noting in here. One, you can see it is entirely lined in carbon fiber, which obviously saves weight, but also gives it a very, very cool look. Not too many cars cargo compartment lining looks like this. Another interesting thing you'll notice up here is that the cargo compartment is actually reasonably sized. This is about the same size as the cargo area in the latest Audi R8. It's not huge, of course, but a lot larger than you'd expect in a million plus dollar supercar, which are usually very, very impractical. This one isn't as bad. Next up, another interesting item in the cargo compartment. You can see there is a little yellow label in there. That is a warning to emergency personnel. Because this car has an electric motor as well, it kind of tells emergency personnel what to do in order to stop fires from spreading as if they would ever find that label. The car's on fire, so they go to that little button in the door, they pop the trunk, they find the little button in the nostril, they open it up, and then they look at that label and say, oh, that's what we're supposed to do. <laughs> Seems kind of ridiculous. One other interesting item you can see while the front trunk lid is up is the windshield wiper assembly in this car. This windshield wiper arm is absolutely massive. Just one wiper in this car and has this huge arm, presumably, so the windshield wiper stays down and can still be usable at really, really high speeds. And next up, we move on to the interior of the P1. And I'm going to start with one of the very first things you notice on the inside when you first open the door. And that would be this little plaque to the left of the driver's footwell in the door sill. It says McLaren P1. And then it says MK edition for Manny Koshbin, the owner of this car. That's a lot cooler than having it say like one of 375, your own special edition, something to aspire to. Now, interestingly, this plaque reminding you how cool you are actually gets covered up when the door is closed. It's kind of a weird thing. So many cars mount plaques like this right in the middle of the interior. This thing, you can't even see the plaque when you're driving. Now, next up, the very next thing you notice when you climb inside this car is the seats, and particularly how tight these seats are. I'm not a huge person, but these seats really, really hug you. Obviously, the point is they grip you to keep you in place when you're on the racetrack going around corners so you don't slide around. But they're really, really tight seats, and they can't be adjusted at all except to go forward or back backwards. That's it. Now, the next thing you notice when you sit down in the P1 is the fact that there are windows above you. This car doesn't have a traditional sunroof and they never made a P1 Roadster or Cabriolet with a convertible top, but this is as close as you get. Now, this is kind of a cool McLaren specialty and it's been evolving. The 720S has the same glass panels, but they integrated them into the doors. And then the Senna has those door panels and they also added additional glass panels at the bottom of the doors. So McLaren is doing interesting things with interior cockpit glass. But in this car, they are fixed in place on the roof, sort of a dual pane sunroof in the McLaren P1. Never knew that. And next up, moving on to some other interesting interior quirks and features of the P1. One of the most amazing things about this interior is the fact that this car has three cup holders. <laughs> I'm serious, there are two underneath the infotainment screen, sort of under the dashboard, and then there's another one in between the seats. So your McLaren P1 million dollar 900 horsepower supercar has three cup holders for two seats, which is impressive. But the practicality situation pretty much ends there because there aren't too many other useful practical items in this interior. For instance, there's really no interior storage. Next to the cup holder between the seats, you have a little compartment, same deal next to those cup holders under the dashboard, a little compartment there, but there's no glove box, there's no storage in the door panels, there's really no storage at all inside the P1. All you have is what's in that front trunk. 
Next up, another interesting item in the P1 is the climate vents, which are actually pretty well thought out. You have two over on the driver's side of the dashboard that aim towards the driver, and then you have two more over on the passenger side that aim towards the passenger. So there's no sharing climate vents, there's no complaining about airflow in the middle vent. There are dedicated vents for both driver and passenger, which is pretty cool. It's also pretty impressive McLaren was able to get all those vents on the dashboard without mounting any on the door panel like you sometimes see in supercars, but there are some interesting items on the door panel worth mentioning. Specifically, close the driver's door and you can see there are two switches on the door panel here. One of those is the mirror control. You toggle it and you can move around the power mirrors. Putting that on the door panel is pretty common. But the other one is the headlight switch. You can use that dial to turn on the headlights, the fog lights, the parking lights. That is unusual. Typically that is on the dashboard to the left or right of the steering wheel. But in this car, they just didn't have enough room. So you have those two switches stuck over on the door panel where you wouldn't usually expect them. The other interesting item on the door panel is, of course, the door release. In this car, it's this little latch that you pull up and it electronically pops the door open. And then from there, it's on you. And it's actually a bit of a chore. The door in this car is quite heavy and you're kind of fighting the hydraulic, which wants to keep it in place and make sure it doesn't just go flopping around. It is kind of work to push the door open, especially from the sitting position in this car. One of the heavier supercar doors I've ever felt. Now, next we move on to some of the other interesting buttons and switches in the P1. I want to start at the very top of the center control stack where you have the engine start stop button front and center. You press that obviously to start and stop the engine. Now to the right of that button, you have something marked E mode and it's green. If you push that and the car has some electric charge, it will go into E mode, turn off the gasoline engine and you can drive on purely electric power. Now, when you do this, it's not really all that fast. It only has about 200 horsepower and it only goes up to about 100 miles an hour and you can only do it for maybe five or 10 miles, but it's there in case you want to electrically drive your supercar. You also, to the right of E-Mode, have a button labeled charge. If you push that, the gasoline powertrain will charge the electric powertrain in case you want to beef up your electricity so you can go back on E-Mode later. Now, next up, moving down and into the center console between the seats, you have a few buttons down here, and they're pretty self-explanatory. The most obvious ones are D, N, and R, drive, neutral, and reverse. Those, of course, are your gears. You'll notice there's no P for park. To put the car in park, you put it in neutral, and then you pull on this parking brake lever in front of these buttons, and then it's stopped. It won't go anywhere, and you can turn it off from there. Your other buttons here are pretty obvious. The hazard lights, the front trunk button once again, and you also have the power locks. Nothing particularly unusual usual in here. Now next we move up from those center console buttons and onto a few more interesting dials in the center control stack starting with these switches mounted in the middle. You can see one says P and one says H. The P is for powertrain and when you adjust that it changes the acceleration characteristics of the car. H is for handling. It'll change the suspension and steering and you can see those dials have three different options N, S, and T which stands for normal sport or track. You have to kind of know the codes in order to use Use this car. The interesting thing is that you can't just turn those dials and put them in normal sport and track. Instead, you have to first push this active button and then you can change the dials to whatever mode you want to go in. Pretty much it means you have to confirm you really want to make that change. Now next up, maybe more interesting than those dials, right below them you have three buttons. The button on the left is marked launch. That obviously is the launch control feature of this car. In the middle you have a button marked race, which is quite interesting. When you you put this car into race mode, it automatically lowers itself so it's really, really tight on the ground and it pops up the wing and back for better downforce. And you can see that happening right now. The car goes much lower, the wing comes up, and it changes the overall profile of the car to make it better for racetrack driving and more downforce keeps it lower and grippier and better in the corners. Now, if you press race again, the car will come out of race mode. The rear wing and the back will kind of retreat back into the body to make the car more slippery like what you'd want if you're just driving on normal streets and as you can see the car also lifts itself back up to a more reasonable position so it can clear normal road hazards in race mode the car is so low that it wouldn't be able to clear anything it's pretty much only suitable for the racetrack now the final button in that group of three is marked boost and if you press that it activates the i pass system which stands for integrated power assist and basically what that means is you have boost turned on 
on, and then you can use this button on the steering wheel marked I Pass. You press that, and the car will automatically give you a little bit of its electric power in order to give you better acceleration when you floor the accelerator. Basically, it gives you additional electric boost at the push of a button when you have boost push and when you press I Pass on the steering wheel. That is pretty cool. Now, it's worth noting when you look at the steering wheel, you will notice that I Pass is not the only button on there. On the other side, there's a blue button marked DRS, and that stands for Drag Reduction System. And when you press that, it allows you to change the position of the rear wing in case you want to reduce your drag, in case you want to make the car more aerodynamic and thus go even faster. But back over to the middle for a second, I want to go over the last item in the center control spec, and that would be the infotainment system. You will note here that it is arranged vertically like a smartphone instead of horizontally like most other infotainment systems. And you will also note if you play with this system, you'll find it to be pretty laggy, not quite as fast or as up to date and modern, full of features as the infotainment systems in many other cars. It is worth noting though that this car came out back in 2013, so it's six years old now. And actually for a six year old car, it is a pretty good system. But by modern standards, it's very much starting to show its age. Now next up, speaking of the infotainment system, there are a few interesting quirks and features worth noting with the infotainment system. My favorite is, like I mentioned in all McLarens, if you pull up the climate controls, the screen that allows you to direct your airflow doesn't just show a person sitting there, it shows a person with a helmet sitting there, which I absolutely love. This is just the climate control screen. They could have just gone with a person, but they put the helmet on there. It's a great detail for a race and track oriented car. It's fantastic. Next up, another interesting item in the infotainment system is the volume control. You can see when you turn the volume control, there are a lot of different volume level. Some cars like 1 through 10 or 1 through 20. This thing is 1 through 100. <laughs> Just in case you're ever on volume level 64 and you're like, you know, I want to go down, but not down to 62. I'm glad there's a 63 setting right there in the middle for the perfect volume experience. And next up, speaking of the sound system, it's worth noting that this car has a Meridian sound system, which I'm sure is very excellent and valuable and luxurious. And if you go into the system settings, it allows you to configure how you want the sound delivered. You can choose between pure, expanded, or extreme, just in case you want extreme sound from your McLaren P1 sound system. And next up, we move on to the steering wheel gauge cluster area. And there's a lot to cover over here, starting with the fact that sticking off the steering column to the right is the cruise control stock. Yes, that's right, on your $2 million, 900 horsepower, ultra high performance supercar, you have cruise control, which I guess is a nice luxury if you plan to take your P1 on a road trip. And there are some other surprisingly thoughtful items inside the gauge cluster that you just wouldn't think a supercar would have. For example, you can adjust the sensitivity of the automatic windshield wipers. And it's not just high or low. Instead, there are five different positions of sensitivity that you can choose from, which is very unusual. You don't see that in Kias or Lexuses let alone a million dollar supercar. Other interesting items in the gauge cluster, one thing that I really like in there is the fact that it doesn't just show tire pressures, but it also shows tire temperatures like a real supercar should. This is far more useful than tire pressure if you're on the racetrack, you wanna know if your tires are warm, if they're too warm, and this car shows you from inside the cockpit. It's a really good idea. And next up, another interesting item in the gauge cluster, if you keep scrolling through menus and info screens, you will eventually find fuel economy, which is a surprise, a lot of supercar cars don't bother showing that, but this one does, and you can see that over the last 180 miles, this car got 6.4 miles per gallon. So I guess having that little electric motor isn't really helping your efficiency all that much if you go pretty much crazy every time you drive this car and just have a lot of fun with it. Now next up, another really interesting feature of the gauge cluster is what happens when you try to go into race mode. I already showed you what happens on the outside of the car, but check this out. You press race and a little screen pops up kind of warning you of the dangers of race mode. You then have to press and hold race again to confirm that yes, you really do want to go into race mode. Once you've done that, the gauge gauge cluster screen actually shows in real time what's happening with the car going into race mode. It shows how many millimeters it's lowering, it shows the position of the wing as it changes, and it tells you how many seconds are left until it achieves 
full race mode. And then you're there and then that screen goes away. Now, if you take it out of race mode, the exact same thing happens, minus that scary screen telling you you're gonna die. Basically, the car once again shows you exactly how many millimeters it's raising. It shows you the position of the spoiler once again in real time, and it shows you precisely how many seconds are left until you are out of race mode and back into your normal street driving situation. Now, aside from that, the gauge cluster screen itself is not particularly interesting. It doesn't swivel like modern McLarens. It's not incredibly configurable. When you're in non-race mode, it just kind of has this display, pretty standard, nothing especially unusual. When you go into race mode, the display switches to this. You can see it highlights the gear you're in instead of the speed you're going, but nothing particularly special or unusual or crazy in this gauge cluster. Again, this is six-year-old technology and all these crazy modern gauge clusters have sort of evolved from here. And next up, we move outside the McLaren P1, and there are many interesting quirks and features out here, but I want to start with my very favorite, probably my very favorite thing about this entire car, and that would be the brake lights. All right, a Bugatti Veyron has brake lights. You can see they're right there. A Pagani Huayra has brake lights. Again, you can see they're right there, very plain, like basically every other car. A McLaren P1 does not have brake lights. It has style back here. And it's very clear that what McLaren did was they decided to style the car exactly as they wanted it and then figure out how to integrate the brake lights. And so the brake lights are merely these thin little strips of light going around this rear grill, perfectly integrated in the exact rear styling of the car. And you can see the turn signals are also integrated into that very same line. I think this is one of the great brake light designs of all time. Rather than just slapping brake lights on there and limiting the effectiveness of this rear grill, McLaren made the brake lights conform to their car are, and it's just a fantastic way to do it. I also like the fact that if you look closely, you can see the brake lights are at their most intense, sort of on the outer edges, and then they kind of dim as they get closer to the middle of the car before completely going dark. A really, really cool effect, and really some of the greatest brake lights and turn signals ever in any car. And speaking of brake lights, next I want to move on to the roof scoop. Now the roof scoop is mounted on the top of the car right above the passenger compartment and all of the coolest McLarens have it. The F1 had it, the Senna has it. You can get it as an option if you spend a lot of money on some other McLarens and all of the P1s have it too. Obviously it takes air from the outside world as you're driving and sends it into the engine compartment. The reason I associate it with the brake lights though is because the roof scoop has this really cool assembly back here where it starts as a roof scoop but then kind of tapers into the third brake light. Again, another excellent example of, yeah, we have to put a brake light there, but we don't have to tack one on and make it look ugly. They did a fantastic job with that third brake light. Now, next to the third brake light, you have a couple of interesting panels. At first glance, you look at those panels and you probably think they're nothing really special, probably just part of the cover over the engine compartment, but they are indeed special. If you push down on the panel on the passenger side of the car, it will pop open and reveal the charge port because you have to charge the electric motor separately if you want your electric power when you're driving your P1. You will also notice that next to that charge port, there is an oil cap. And indeed, that is how you add oil to your P1. If you ever get low on oil, you wanna add some, just pop open this charge port door, unscrew the cap, and that's where you add oil. Now over on the other side of the third brake light, the panel over there also pops open. You push down on it, opens up, and it reveals two different places where you can put stuff. The most obvious one looks familiar. That's how you put fuel in the McLaren P1. You go to the gas station, you stick the fuel pump in there, and that's what you do. The other cap in there sharing that compartment with the fuel door is coolant. If you wanna add coolant to your P1, if it starts overheating, that is where you put it in. Now, you might be wondering, why did they put those fluid caps inside these panels, the oil and the coolant? Why didn't they just put them in the engine compartment? And the reason for that is the engine cover in the P1 is fixed in place. You at home are not allowed to open it. And that means you can't go in and stare at the engine in your P1 after paying a million or two million dollars for one. It's fixed. The only way you can look at it is through this glass, but you can't see all of the rest of the cool engine stuff in your P1. 
Nonetheless, I am absolutely certain it is there because, well, this car sounds like it has quite an engine. Take a listen to a startup and then a couple of revs. Since we're around back, one other item I love back here is wing related. You can see the wing has all these pieces and parts that make it move and tilt and slide, and McLaren didn't bother to cover up any of that stuff. There's no point trying to hide it. It's all functional back there. You want to save as much weight as possible. And so it looks very mechanical, very exposed, but it also looks really, really cool. I like the fact they didn't bother trying to hide or cover any of that stuff up. And finally, I'm going to move on to two other rather interesting things about the P1, starting with the color. Now, I mentioned before that this particular car used to be white. And as you can see, now it's not. It's this exposed matte carbon fiber. I'm gonna have Manny, the owner of the car, explain why he decided to make that change in a few minutes. But first, you may be thinking, how exactly do you change the color of a car like this? The answer is, it's actually simpler than you might think because this car only has five real major pieces of bodywork. You have the front clamshell, the rear clamshell, the two doors, and then this piece over the front storage compartment. And so if you want to change the color, you can do that. Although you wouldn't want Jim's body shop down the street unscrewing the panels on your McLaren P1. Now, the other really interesting thing about the P1 is the stuff you get when you buy a P1. You spend over a million dollars on a supercar, you didn't think they merely gave you a supercar. No, there's more to it than that. In fact, there's quite a few interesting little P1 artifacts that come along with the car, starting with this color sample. Like I mentioned, the car used to be white. This was the color that it initially was. McLaren will send these color samples to owners so they can see, okay, yes, this is the color my car will be. And you can also see it sort of in the shape of the car, so you can hold it to various different lights and kind of see theoretically how it will look. And that wasn't the only little extra goodie you got when you bought a P1. There was more to it than that. You see, the owners of these cars ordered them, and then they had to wait years for delivery, so McLaren wanted to tide them over by sending them some cool P1 stuff while they waited. And one good example is this model car. People who bought a P1 new were sent this model car to kind of help keep them interested and remind them that, yes, the real one will be coming soon. <laughs> I really like to see that. You also got this book and you can see the book kind of goes through the production, the creation, the history of the McLaren P1 and it's signed by some of the designers, the engineers of the car. That's sort of the P1 book, again meant to be a special goodie to keep P1 owners occupied while they waited. And one other interesting P1 goodie you get when you buy one is inside this leather portfolio. You unzip it and there's a letter in there from McLaren thanking you for choosing a P1. You'll never regret your decision, the most special car, blah blah blah. But there's also this little silver credit card size piece in there that tells you what serial number your P1 is in the production line. No funny business with production numbers here. Each one is indeed individually numbered, although only if you keep your little silver credit card thing with your P1, like this one has. And so those are the quirks and features of the McLaren P1. And now it's time to get it out on the road. But before I do, I wanna to talk to the car's owner, Manny Koshbin. Manny, thank you for having me. We are in quite an amazing space here. My pleasure. And this is really an incredible space with some really incredible cars. Thank you. What do you think about this one specifically? How do you enjoy it? Ooh. Well, I've said it over and over for some of your viewers that watch me on my YouTube videos. Uh, this is my ultimate favorite driving machine. Really? Mm -hmm. Even and that's high praise because yeah. we're sitting next to a Senna and Bugattis and Yes. And this is the the, the the best driving. Ultimate. In the race mode, it's like the perfect balance of daredevil type of driving. You right. know, the rear kind of right, away, right, right. your palms are start swimming <laughs> and you can push it to the limit and then the you know the turbos kick in and then you can push the iPads button. Uh, that gives you instant, uh, you know, electric motors kick in and it just jolts you. You don't worry just... about driving it hard? It doesn't scare the hell out of you? No, you know, uh, you know, it does, but you know, that's the part of the fun of the life and having these cars, you know, if you're going to drive it in the auto mode and 
drive it like a grandma, you know. What's, What's the, the point? point of having it? What? So now you're saying that that it's your favorite driving whatever we're standing right next to the you know yes. the, the newest the so you Senna. think even more the the p1 yeah. even more than the senna absolutely even though it weighs 400 pounds i think 400 pounds heavier um i think it's the the technology that's been built in you know the the electric motors with the ipass button and it's just the, the way it's made the computer you know controls the electric engine with the gas engine is almost no lag and yeah, you'll get to experience it, you know, when you drive it. But yeah. it's just like instant power all the time, and just the handling is totally different than this car. This car feels very heavy because of the downforce, uh, but this one wants to fly, you know. And the best part of this car, if you run out of gas, there's an right. emote, <laughs> which is you know you can save the environment in, while you're driving around in your supercar. Yeah. Unlike the Bugatti, you know, I ran out of gas in my Bugatti Mansuri, <laughs> and what? I had so many fans that stopped by, but I had to call AAA. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when the AAA comes when you run out of gas and we got it? There's no, it's nothing good comes out of it because he only has 87 octane and that car takes 100. Did you consider at any point getting gas earlier than that when you saw the gas gauge going down or that just yeah, wasn't? Yeah, you know, I was trying to, you know, to get the last drop out of it. it was, right, it was a right. Bad, bad choice. <laughs> right. A carbon, full carbon fiber yes. body on this car, and there's yes. a story behind that. Yeah, so originally this car was uh, diamond Alaskan white. It was the whitest white they had, and I had them bleach all the leather interior to kind of get as white as possible. So I love white. But originally, obviously I opted for full carbon fiber, but they said, oops, sorry, it's not an option, but when it becomes an option, we'll let you know. So a year later, they called me, they said, uh, good news, they're gonna make 25 carbon fiber body additions. Here's the price. I said, sign me, sign me up, send me the, uh, the wiring instructions. <laughs> so how does it, what's the process? Do they send the panels and your local McLaren dealership does the work no. or did you have to send the car back? Oh no, the car goes back to MSO, oh. McLaren and Special Operations. They take everything mm -hmm. off, five cl uh, clamshells and it's brand new body. How long did it take yeah. for this, for that process? Shipping it, going yeah, there? Yeah, I think it was about six or eight months. Did you have, you had a 918, you said? Yes. So you kept this and not the 918? No, the 918 is heavier mm -hmm. and it, to me it was over computerized, you know? When Interesting. I, I drove it, it, it wasn't making my hands sweat, even though it's faster. Interesting. Interesting. Zero to 60 is faster than this car because of four wheel drive. But it just it's felt done. more, it felt less crazy. Yeah, I, it wasn't giving me the thrill. Interesting. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah. You know, after you drive all these cars, you know, you always want to, uh, you know, you're attracted to the one that, you know, gets you excited, right? Right. When you want to push it to the limit. Right. All right, well, are you ready to go drive this thing? Yes, let's do it. Are you scared? Um, no, I know you have a lot of followers, that means you make lots of money. <laughs> so I can replace it? <laughs> you crash it, you buy it. All right, well, I'm scared. Right. I'm even more scared now. All right, driving the P1. Here we are. You're really not scared? Nah. I am. So you look around the interior. Yep. I mean, this is a really cool place to spend time. And, and yes. there are some similarities to other McLaren interiors, but there's also some pretty substantial differences. There's buttons that other ones don't have. Whew, rough ride. <laughs> but that's kind of the point. But Look, yeah, you can feel every lane bump. <laughs> God, that was half throttle. Oh yeah, I know, you're just warming up the tires. The steering precision is really impressive, even just going around those little corners, which is interesting because this yeah. is not a brand new car. You know, I normally associate yeah. the most precise steering with like the newest stuff on the market, yeah. but this was obviously really well developed, you know, when it came out. Sir, can I see your insurance? Oh my God. You know, I said you're gonna take it easy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Wow, that is some serious, serious. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's insane? I totally yeah. agree with you versus 918. 918 is awesome and it does it's feel heavy. that fast, but this, the sound, it's it the the so visceral. More agile. Yeah. So much, so much more agile. And, and just you're just you feel like you're in a crazier thing yeah. here like it feels like a more insane even compared to LaFerrari this is definitely more raw it's I agree with you by the way Senna, Senna does feel heavier there's yeah. no doubt this car feels like it accelerates quicker yeah. which is oh my God. Jesus you know he's red right <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I figure we got good brakes you know and indeed look at that Boom. You're crazy. <laughs> what? Uh, well, it always feels the scarier when you're in a passenger seat. How often I do you hear. ride in the passenger seat? Do you, uh, do not you... often. <laughs> yeah, bad. Now, the funny thing is when you sit at a stoplight, it actually is fairly tame. You hear yeah. a little bit of the motor, but it's not like an old 80s, yeah. like the F40, where yeah. it's like, you yeah. know, there's a lot happening. Vibrate. Like right. the Senna. The Senna is vibrating so much, your yeah. windows are shaking. It feels you like a race carry, car. You can't carry out the right. conversation, but 
this is uh, yeah, this is one that really is like a, one of those sleeper cars. Totally. But there's not that much interest, like from you know, which is surprising. I mean, McLarens. Yeah. This car doesn't look dramatically different from a lot of the other McLarens. McLarens have become a lot more common, and so. Yeah. There's a lot less interest, I'm sure. But even like this dude yeah. who's, in a, you know, you'd think you'd, people would be like, whoa, what yeah. is this thing? And no, that's what I'm telling you. If I was in the Bugatti Mansory with the carbon and gold, people would be taking their phones be out. Yeah. This one, not so much. Interesting. It is reasonably civilized. It feels very stable. It feels, yeah. it feels reason. Now, it well, is bumpy though. Is, if you think this is quiet, wait until you put it on the Oh, you, you, yeah. Oh. <laughs> is it still fast? Uh, it goes, I think, it goes. 100 miles an hour. It's but not, it's nowhere near as fast. It's, no. It feels like a normal car. Yeah, because you're only going on 200 horsepower electric right. engine. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's the ride is, is harsh. Every bump you feel yeah. pretty significantly. It's a very stable car, but you definitely are getting pushed around. Absolutely. You never forget that you're in a supercar in this thing. Oh my God, the speed that it gets up to yeah. so insanely fast. You just said it's like a Ducati. That's such a great analogy. Right. This car feels, feels sounds more like a, a, like a sport bike, super bike than anything that I've ever, ever driven before. It is so fast to change speeds and change directions and everything like that. That is incredible. And so that's the McLaren P1. This really is the ultimate modern McLaren and one of the greatest supercars ever made in terms of price, performance, styling, driving experience, and rarity is there are two and a half times more 918 Spiders than P1s. This really is a tremendously special car and I'm thrilled that I finally had the chance to review it. And now it's time to give the P1 a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the P1 looks good, great even, but the styling is too similar to other McLaren models considering how special this is supposed to be. It gets an 8 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in like 2.7 seconds and it gets a 10 out of 10. Handling is amazingly sharp and it easily gets a 10 out of 10. Fun factor is insane, truly incredibly thrilling and it gets a 10 out of 10. Finally, cool factor, and this one is obvious, it's one of the coolest modern cars and it gets a 10 out of 10 for a total weekend score score of 48 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The P1 is about average for cars like this and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort, the P1 is pretty rough, but again, normal enough for cars like this and it gets a 3 out of 10. Quality is decent, though I'd worry long term about the reliability of a million dollar plug-in hybrid British supercar, but clearly it's well made and it gets a 7 out of 10. Practicality is laughable and it gets a 1 out of 10. Finally, value, and this is a tough one. These sell for more than 918 Spider, which makes sense because there are way fewer P1s, but I just feel like McLaren hasn't quite proven itself as a road car brand yet for me to fully accept this as a $2 million car. I'm giving it a 6 out of 10, but that could go up in the future. That gives us a total daily score of 23 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 71 out of 100, which places it here against the top hypercars and supercars. It loses to the LaFerrari and the 918 Spider by a point. The LaFerrari wins by a point in styling, the 918 Spider wins wins by a point in quality. But really, I think the P1 is probably the most exhilarating of the three to drive. All right, a Bugatti Veyron has brake lights. You can see they're right there. A Pugatti, a Pugatti, 